Hello everyone, and thank you for joining. Today's topic is skin cancer prevention and early detection with a focus on people of color. Our speaker for this presentation is Dr. Nijawan, an associate professor of dermatology at UT Southwestern Medical Center and the director of Parkland Memorial Hospital Skin Tumor Clinic. He specializes in the surgical management of skin cancers, reconstructive surgery, and is an expert in Mohs micrographic surgery. Dr. Nijawan also serves as the Assistant Fellowship Director of the UT Southwestern Micrographic Surgery and Dermatologic Oncology Fellowship. So without further ado, Dr. Nijawan, the floor is yours. So much for the um, very kind introduction. Um, hoping to keep this kind of casual and low key. So feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, really want to make this targeted and geared towards the audience and really want to Make sure I'm addressing um, the questions you all may have about this, and hopefully a lot of my slides will kind of provide some of that information as well. Um, and so again, just to start, I have no conflicts of interest um, to report. Um, so I want to start with one of my favorite TV shows I watched growing up. I don't know if anybody else watched Seinfeld at all. Um, you know, as a dermatologist, my friends, my close family members, they all kind of you know, make that joke uh, that I'm a pimple popper as a dermatologist. Oh, wow. um, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard that before too. And especially with, um, you know, social media, you know, dermatologist, um, Dr. Sandra Lee, who's got her own show as Pimple Popper MD, we're all familiar with it. Um, but in this scene um, of how this whole pimple popper thing came about, Jerry's dating a doctor and only later after a few dates does he realize that she's a dermatologist. And he actually kind of got pretty upset because he was giving her this credit of being this life-saving doctor. And all of a sudden he finds out that, that she's just merely a dermatologist. And so he takes her to dinner and asks her, how's the life-saving business? And she kind of coyly responds, it's fine. And then he kind of gets a little bit aggressive and, and says, it must take a really big zit to kill a man. And, um, you know, he, he, he went further to say, you call yourself a lifesaver, but I call you pimple popper MD. This is how that phrase really kind of came about. And then a patient happens to see his doctor sitting at dinner and um, he approaches her and says, I really want to thank you again for saving my life. And Jerry Seinfeld is totally perplexed. How did a dermatologist save his life? And he responds that, you know, he had skin cancer and then Jerry's like skin cancer. You know, he realized his mistake of forgetting about skin cancer as being something that could be life-threatening and something that's important for us all to be aware about and uh, knowledgeable about so we can hopefully prevent or early detect it. Um, and so that's really what my talk is about, um, why skin cancer awareness is really important, is even in uh, people of, with skin of color. What are the different types of skin cancer for y'all to be aware of? Um, what are some signs of skin cancer to look for? And how do we treat skin cancer? And how can you go about protecting your skin um, to potentially pr prevent skin cancer development uh, as well. Um, and, and again, just to start, um, why is skin cancer awareness so important in skin of color? Because, you know, it's interesting, studies have shown that patients of color have actually worse outcomes, including death, compared to Caucasians with skin cancer um, itself. Um, African Americans specifically have the worst outcomes of all racial subgroups um, with skin cancer diagnoses. And, and the question is, why are these outcomes worse? There's probably many different factors that play into this, but oftentimes it's a later presentation to doctors, which again leads to diagnosis at a more advanced stage. And then um, when it's diagnosed at a more advanced stage, it's harder to treat um, uh, and more challenging. Um, now, um, when we think about the most deadly type of skin cancer, it's really melanoma that's the most deadly type of skin cancer. Now, it, it is true that we definitely see more skin cancer in fair skin individuals. Um, however, you, we still see plenty of skin cancer in patients of color as well. And these are kind of the rates of just melanoma. Melanoma is kind of the more rare type of skin cancer, but it is thought to be the more deadly type of skin cancer um, as well. Um, but again, we do see it in all skin types, um, including people of color. Um, and so it's something to be aware of. And then when we think about melanoma deaths, um, it is still uh, a deadly disease. Um, and unfortunately in patients of color, um, for a variety of reasons, it seems to be diagnosed at a later stage and a higher rate of death in patients of color compared to 
um, those are fairer skinned individuals. So um, hopefully this talk will kind of just kind of educate you all in terms of what to look for um, and just kind of be aware of um, skin cancer. And again, um, you know, people of color often um, have that kind of um, false idea that they can't develop skin cancer. Um, and, you know, um, Bob Marley actually died at the age of 36 because of melanoma that had spread to other parts of the body. So he's kind of the, so that somebody everyone is familiar with, um, somebody of color who unfortunately passed away way too young because of melanoma. And um, again, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the different types of skin cancer. So the most common is basal cell skin cancer. Squamous cell skin cancer is the second most common. And then melanoma is probably thought to be the third most common. Um, and, and again, all these skin cancers that I'm mentioning are seen in all different skin types. Definitely the majority in patients um, who are fair skin individuals, but we still see plenty, especially at a big referral center that I'm at currently at Southwestern in Parkland. Um, we definitely see a lot of patients with color um, who develop these skin cancers. There are also less common skin cancers just to kind of make you aware of um, dermatofibroma, sarcoma, protuberans, microcystic adnexal carcinoma, Merkel cell carcinoma, sebaceous carcinoma. Again, pretty rare cancers to, to just, you know, to, to recognize if you ever see that term. Um, but again, unfortunately, poor outcomes in patients of color. Um, but really, I'm going to be kind of highlighting the three most common um, and, and um, hopefully that will kind of, um, I don't know, give a good background in terms of skin cancer. So, so what are some signs of skin cancer? So when we think about the most deadly type of skin cancer, it's really melanoma. And this is kind of the mnemonic that we teach our patients about, so they're aware of. Um, it's the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma. And A is asymmetry, meaning if you were to cut something in half, um, it doesn't reflect the same as the, on both sides. You see the border being ir irregular, not this perfect round shape, kind of like this snake-like border. If you see more than one color within a mole, um, that's kind of a more concerning feature. If it's something that's bigger than six millimeters or kind of the head of a pencil eraser, um, that's, that's a little bit more concerning in terms of size. And then change. E is probably the most significant marker for melanoma. If something was you know, three months ago, three millimeters, and now today it's seven millimeters, that change is something that really is important to get evaluated because um, that's kind of a sign of um, a skin cancer, something that's rapidly changing, evolving, and developing. But again, these are our ABCDs of melanoma. Um, and again, um, kind of highlights that irregular border there, asymmetry, if you cut something in half, it really doesn't mirror each other on each side. Um, those are all signs. Now, these are all just kind of examples of melanoma and skin of color. Interestingly enough, patients of color are more likely to develop melanoma on their fingers and feet. Um, and it's a specific subtype of melanoma called acral lentiginous melanoma that's thought to be more common in patients of color. Um, areas that are more or less sun protected, if you think about it, our feet, you know, how often does our, do our feet get sun exposure necessarily? Um, and it's very common to a not even take a look at your feet, right? Um, for weeks or months, at the, especially the bottom of your feet. Who who truly looks at the bottom of their feet um, on a regular basis? But it's something to just be aware of because that's where something could brew, and that's oftentimes the reason. Sometimes these are diagnosed at a later stage because just you know you don't pay attention to it. Um, so people of color, we're always kind of educating patients to look at their fingernails, their toenails, underneath their feet to see and mark for change. Now, sometimes when I give these talks, um, I have you know a line of patients or people and audience members asking me, hey, is this spot cancer? They somehow think that every brown spot on their skin is now cancer. And it's really important to know that not every brown spot is gonna be a skin cancer. Um, there are many benign or not cancerous conditions that appear brown or black even. Um, this is a handful of them and I'll show you some pictures to kind of see the differences in them. Um, and, um, you know, for example, these are called seborrheic keratoses. They're kind of brown um, spots. We call these spots of wisdom because we definitely see them in older patients and nobody wants to be told that they're getting older. Um, so we just say, we just tell our patients that they're just getting wiser with time. So these are spots of wisdom. Again, they look kind of brown or, you know, even black. Um, and sometimes, you know, people start with one and, you know, 10 years later, they seem to have 50 on their back. Not worrisome, not a sign of cancer. 
um, but it's you know our unique training that really helps us determine what's something that's benign, not worrisome, versus what's something that needs a biopsy for evaluation. And for patients, it's hard sometimes for them to differentiate. But we see this, you know, and in our training, we do years of training to really be able to differentiate these different different signs. But this is a benign diagnosis, um, not worrisome, never will become cancerous. Um, lent lentigos or lentigenes, little sunspots, and people of all different skin types can get little sunspots as well. Again, um, just more, more or less a sign of sun damage, um, but not necessarily a marker for skin cancer in any way. And then, um, you know, uh, Morgan Freeman, uh, well-known actor, you see the little brown spots on his cheeks. And um, uh, th this is called dermatosis papulosa nigra. It is just a totally benign, not cancer is not worrisome condition. Again, more and more of the spots of wisdom, age spots that kind of happen with time. And if they're ever bothersome to anybody, they're easily treated, um, cosmetically speaking, um, easy for a dermatologist to kind of get rid of them and burn them off um, without, you know, um, side effects, without much side effects too. So again, um, brown spots, but not melanoma. Um, and then melasma. Melasma is a very common skin condition in patients of color, especially, but all skin types as well, where they almost get these kind of very ill-defined kind of brown patches on their cheeks or upper lip and even sometimes the forehead as well. Again, more a sign of a sun. Um, and there's a hormonal component to this as well. We see this oftentimes a lot more in females rather than males, but again, we, we do see this in all, um, in both genders as well. Um, and then keloids. Keloids is, again, um, just kind of thickened scar tissue. Definitely see keloids more in people of color. We still see it in, in you know, Caucasians um, in all skin types. But um, this is a sign of um, kind of overgrowth of scar tissue more than anything else. Uh, sometimes these get painful and can keep growing larger with time. Again, easily treatable by a dermatologist, but not a sign of cancer necessarily. But what are some other signs of skin cancer to be aware of? Um, oftentimes we'll tell patients it's a sore that never heals. You've got one little area that kind of heals up, but that skin breaks down every few weeks. It seems to be this never ending cycle of healing and then not get, and not and breaking down again, open sore and healing again. That's a very early sign of skin cancer that probably needs further evaluation and treatment. A spot that bleeds or a mole that bleeds is a sign of um, skin cancer that needs further evaluation. Um, uh, that, that unique rare skin cancer that I refer to as called dermatofibroma sarcoma protuberans, sometimes they're mistaken for keloids. It almost seems like a big scar um, that keeps expanding with time, even years at a time. Um, and patients often mistake it for being just a keloid, but they can't recall a trauma to that area before. Now, keloids normally for, form from trauma. You had surgery in an area or you got an ear piercing, that's where a keloid forms. But these kind of happened without any known trauma before. And, and an expanding scar is something that needs further evaluation as well. But, you know, and, and skin cancer can be painful, but often, more often than not, skin cancer is painless. And that's why these kind of go undetected and for months or years at a time and, and present at a later diagnosis because it's just a brown freckle that people ignore and think, hey, it's not hurt, harmful now. I'm going to ignore it because it's not bothering me right now. Um, and then once it gets to the point where it's bleeding or painful, sometimes it may have been kind of diagnosed at a later stage than it needed to be. Um, so oftentimes skin cancer is painless and it's important to think just because something doesn't bother you doesn't mean it, it may not be something worrisome. Now, um, you know, we, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, the acral lentiginous melanoma that we often see in patients of color. And so skin cancer does occur in areas of, of the skin where it has had no sun exposure whatsoever. Um, and, and it's really important to recognize that skin cancer can happen anywhere on the skin. So oftentimes when patients come see us, um, we get them in a gown and we literally look at every square inch of their skin from head to toe, making sure we're evaluating them completely um, to make sure skin cancer has not developed in any area, not just areas that have been exposed to the sun. Um, and in patients of color especially, skin cancer is more often than not in areas that are protected from the sun, like the palms or bottom of the feet or toenails, even inside the mouth or even in the groin and general areas there are other areas where skin cancer can develop. Um, and so um, I'm a member of this, um, this society, this national society called the American Society for Dermatologic Surgery. 
and it, and you know we've done a lot more education to kind of show that skin cancer is really colorblind and um, you know it can occur in any skin type and it can cause death in any skin type and so um, it's really important to just be aware of it and and be proactive with um, skin exams etc and I'll be kind of touching on on that a little bit later in my talk as well um so what are some other signs of skin cancer other than melanoma. So these are some kind of pictures of what skin cancer can look like. Um, you can kind of see these scaly areas on hands, um, even anywhere on the face. Um, and this is called actinic keratosis um, that can evolve into squamous cell skin cancer, kind of these scaly rough patches that you know don't seem to go away. They're oftentimes kind of more than anything a sign of sun damage. They can feel like sandpaper. Um, and what we try to do when patients come to see us with this, we try to treat it so it doesn't have a chance to evolve with this skin cancer. We try to treat them with either a cold spray where we're kind of burning those precancer cells off. There's even a light therapy we use, and even topical chemotherapy creams that we can use kind of kind of stop this precancer in its track so it doesn't have a chance to evolve into a skin cancer. And then basal cell skin cancer. Um, it's basal cell skin cancer is really the most common type of cancer there is, period. Over a few million diagnosed every year in the US alone. Um, and it's the, uh, the most common skin cancer as well. Um, luckily, basal cell skin cancer will not spread to other parts of the body um, or metastasize. So it's not necessarily a deadly type of skin cancer, but it can slowly grow deeper and wider in certain area where it eats away the normal skin. And so if we can kind of catch this early, treat it, get rid of it early, um, the patients can get healed pretty quickly um, with it. Um, and these are really easily treatable with in-office surgical procedures. And then the second most common type of skin cancer is squamous cell skin cancer. They can kind of feel like kind of kind of little bumps that constantly bleed and never fully heal, kind of scaly patches that um, kind of sometimes bleed as well on their own. Um, and again, the whole goal of skin cancer detection is catching things as early as possible because that's the easiest time to get them treated so it doesn't become a bigger or more worrisome spot. Um, and again, most skin cancers, I'd say 99% of skin cancers are incredibly easy to treat under local anesthesia alone, like going to the dentist where you're awake the whole time. We kind of cut it out, we stitch you up and you, you're on your way. So the whole goal is to treat it early um, and catch it early. If you, if one were to allow these to grow deeper and wider, then it's a much bigger deal where we have to cut deeper potentially. And if it's spread to other lymph nodes or other parts of the body, there's a lot more involved like chemotherapy and radiation. But the good news again in general is about 97 to 99% amount of skin cancers in general don't need radiation. They don't need chemotherapy. They don't need immunotherapy. They don't need you know, hospitalizations or anything like that. It's just in office treatment, cut the cancer out, and, and kind of get um, the doctor can kind of get you healed up oftentimes with stitches where you're healed in a week and you're on, on back to normal life. Um, and that's again, the, the thing that we stress the most, early detection is key with everything. So it can be treated much more easily than if it were to kind of evolve and be bigger. And, and this is kind of what I do every day. Um, pretty much all day, every day, I'm cutting out skin cancers and, and getting patients healed up um, and looking like themselves very quickly. So then, then the question becomes like, how do I check for things and how, what should, should I be looking for? So can you check your own skin? Absolutely. It's one of the few cancers there is that can be detected with a careful skin exam alone. Um, and so what we recommend uh, our patients to do is just once a month, um, you know, get in a mirror and look at different parts of your body, lift up your armpits. Um, you know, you can look at your back through the mirror um, as well. If you have a partner or family member um, who lives with you or if you're close with, you're comfortable with having them take a look at areas that you can't necessarily see that well. We do recommend self skin exams once a month. Um, Pick the first day of the month. If your birthday is, you know, May 15th, do it on the 15th of every month. Um, just something that you'll remember to take a look at. Um, and then if you notice anything new, changing, the signs that we've mentioned, a, a bleeding sore that doesn't fully heal, um, bring it to a doctor's attention to see if it needs further evaluation or not. Um, and again, what are some things that should make you suspicious? Anything that's new or different that wasn't there before? So sometimes we can't remember. Hey, was that brown spot there, you know, six months ago, 12 months ago, et cetera? 
So I'll tell patients even, you know, luckily we all have smartphones these days. You can take pictures of your own skin, especially areas you can't see well, have a family member take a picture of your back. So they kind of know what it looks like in 2022. So 10 years go by in 2032, you have the reference point. Hey, that mole was never there 10 years ago and it's brand new now. So you, you can kind of really be more proactive in your own healthcare and your own screenings in a way to see what's different, see what's new um, and, and see what needs potentially further evaluation or not. Um, and then anything that starts bleeding or hurts spontaneously, that's a sign that may need further evaluation, a spot that doesn't heal or grow away. So then that's growing with time more rapidly than you know you think it should. I um, mean, really anything that's like that you tell yourself that that inner gut feeling, hey, this seems off. Um, I should probably get this checked out. Those are all things that you should bring to a doctor's attention. So here I'm just going to show some classic pictures of, um, of skin cancer. Just, just to show, show you the variety of how it can present. You may never even think of it um, as presenting in a certain way. And hopefully this will kind of give you perspective of what they can look like, especially in, in, in patients of color. So this was a small little basal cell on the upper lip. Um, and the patient just would report that, you know, when he shaved over the ear or trimmed it, it would kind of blade. So he kind of stopped shaving his mustache um, just because to prevent it from nicking because skin cancer cells are not that normal skin. They're what we call friable, meaning you touch it in a weird way, it's more likely to bleed or not. Um, so very small little area caught early, very easy to treat when it's at this point as well. Here's kind of a sore behind um, somebody's ear. Again, um, sometimes people for think, oh, it's just a sore from my glasses hitting it. We see this on the nasal bridge sometimes behind the ear. Um, and again, um, easy, to, easy to treat when it's caught this early. Um, you can kind of see that scab that's formed um, without trauma. It's just the scab from the actual cancer itself. This is a spot on, on somebody's back, actually. Um, this is that scar that they thought was, um, you know, just a keloid that was developing on their back, but they didn't recall any trauma there. They didn't have any surgery there. It was just growing bigger with time. And this took a few years, actually, to get to the size before they presented to us for treatment. Um, and this is that rare diagnosis of, of dermatofibroma sarcoma protuberans, what we refer to as DFSP. Again, something different that seems off. It wasn't there before. Um, and, um, you know, and that's the earlier you present to um, a person, uh, the easier it is to treat. Apologies in advance. Some of these pictures are can be a little jarring a little bit if you're not used to seeing some of the skin stuff. Um, but this is just a sign of skin cancer on the fingertips. Um, again, patients of color um, oftentimes get skin cancer on their fingertips, um, their toes, et cetera. Um, and sometimes these are linked to viruses as well, um, uh, specifically the HPV virus when they have a history of warts on their fingers and, you know, kids get warts, you know, all the time. Um, and that virus can still linger around for years and decades and later on create, um, you know, a potential skin cancer association as well. So um, a spot that doesn't heal should kind of trigger a evaluation with a dermatologist. And this is, again, uh, a little bit more um, photos of melanoma, kind of a black streak or brown streak in a nail that seems to get wider um, is an early sign of melanoma, especially in a patient of color. Um, when you see also that pigment, not just on the nail plate itself or on the nail itself, um, but it starts to extend onto the skin surrounding it. So um, you can kind of see how it's extending onto the cuticle and the fingertip um, when they flip it over too. Again, all a sign of um, melanoma in the finger um, as well. This is a um, Hispanic patient um, who developed, um, you know, you see it being brown and you're like, oh, the, probably melanoma. This is actually a pigmented basal cell. So interestingly enough, if you have color in your natural skin, your cancers can have color within them too, even if they're not melanoma. So this is a basal cell skin cancer that was creating its own pigment because she naturally had a little pigment in her skin. Um, and again, easily treatable when it's caught early. You can see this probably went probably a few years before it was um, before she came to see us um, because um, she just thought it was a sunspot really and just kind of ignored it. Thought it was a freckle that was just kind of you know not going away, and then eventually got to the point where like, hey, this is definitely bigger than you know uh, the other sunspots would be. Um, and this is uh, another example of a little um, wart um, that has evolved into a skin cancer on the finger. Um, again, um, not necessarily a sun exposed area. So just highlighting that skin cancer can be found anywhere on the body, um, including fingers and nails. This is a Hispanic patient who developed, again, a pigmented basal cell skin cancer on the cheek. 
Um, again, it looks black, so you're in dark brown. So you, you know, you, your first thought is this must be a melanoma, but luckily um, not. This is a basal cell. Um, and basal cells are easily treatable. Again, basal cells don't spread other parts of the body. They don't kill you necessarily. They just slowly with time grow bigger and bigger with time. This was probably um, on this patient for 10 years before he presented um, for further evaluation. So again, even slow growing things can be skin cancer, especially when they're the low risk type of skin cancer like basal cell or squamous cell. Um, they just kind of linger around longer and just never fully heal. And that's again, the sign that you want to see a dermatologist. Another kind of spot um, behind the ear, again, a pigmented um, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, just a surface skin cancer, but again, has some pigment to it behind the ear. Um, another example of a, of a basal cell skin cancer in a Hispanic patient, um, just seeing the different variety of how these can present. They're not all pink necessarily if they're a basal cell, um, oftentimes, um, and, and not every brown spot is a melanoma, um, in terms of skin cancer, even brown spots can be kind of pigmented um, low risk. Another spot um, on the lip. Now, smoking is also associated with skin cancer development, especially skin cancer around the lip area too. Um, so that's another preventable kind of modality. You know, smoking sensation is so incredibly important for one's overall health, but even from a skin cancer perspective as well. Hey. And another spot uh, on the ear, just to kind of show you the variety of how different these skin cancers can look elsewhere on the body and even on the hand as well. Um, another sore on the cheek that doesn't fully heal. So what else can contribute to skin cancer development? I, I talked a little bit about this um, when we talked about smoking um, as being a factor as well. Um, some people with their work um, or um, um, can be exposed to different chemicals that can put somebody at risk for more skin cancer development as well. Arsenic is a chemical that is known to kind of lead to skin cancer um, development as well. Some people have genetic um, predisposition. Um, albinism is a, is a more common disease than one may think. Um, and because they don't naturally have pigment on their skin, their the risk, any little sun exposure can be um, quite damaging to their skin where they're more likely to develop skin cancer as well. Um, and different viruses, I kind of uh, mentioned this. HPV virus is a virus that causes warts. Um, there's, you know, almost uh, essentially 100 different types of HPV virus. Some are considered low risk. That's what we see in kids who develop warts on their fingers and things like that. But there are high risk HPV subtypes that can lead to skin cancer development. Um, we, we see it associated with cervical cancer as well and, um, you know, general cancers as well. Um, so again, viruses can play a role in skin cancer development. Um, and so it's important to be aware of that. And then um, people who may have had previous burns or scars, um, that's kind of become unhealthy tissue in a way. The scar tissue that's formed over it can predispose one to developing skin cancer. So um, even just thinking about burning your hand, you know, um, uh, uh, the worse the burn, the higher the risk um, of a skin cancer later on because it's just chronic inflammation that can kind of trigger the development of these skin cancers as well. Um, and then the, the other big thing that uh, sometimes we forget about is other medications that we take for um, a particular reason can decrease our immune um, system's function and put us at risk for developing skin cancer. Um, so um, we really commonly see, and I've actually developed a specialty clinic at Southwestern for this, patients who have had a solid organ transplant, like a heart transplant, a lung transplant, a liver transplant, or a bone marrow transplant, they're on so many different medications that suppress their immune system, so they don't fight off their new organ, their new heart, their new lung. And that medication um, is probably the biggest kind of um, cause for skin cancer development in those patient populations. Um, because they just can't f fight off infection as well. And just as a, they can't fight infection as well, they can't fight um, cancer as well too. Um, and so immunosuppression is something very, very, you know, uh, plays a big role in skin cancer development. Um, patients who, you know, are being treated for lupus, for example, are on immunosuppressants um, as well. And those drugs that they're on can increase their risk for skin cancer development too. So it's something that we always educate our patients about, um, especially if they're on these kind of, medications that suppress your immune system. And then um, if you've ever had radiation exposure for another cancer, let's say years ago, um, even that, that field is never gonna be truly healthy 
skin. Um, and unfortunately, that area um, is an area that can have skin cancer development um, within it as well. So how do we treat skin cancer? I kind of alluded and discussed this a little bit um, before. Um, it really depends on how early it's caught. And that's why we really stress the importance of early detection. Um, if there's something, uh, if there's a spot that's kind of worrisome, the, what we do as dermatologists is we do essentially a 60 second procedure where we put a little bit of numbing at that base and we take a little sample and send it to the lab for analysis to kind of get better sense of what that skin looks like under the microscope to see if it's cancerous or not. Um, so the goal always is to diagnose as early as possible um, because that's how um, we'll guide our management. Now, most things just need to be cut out. Um, when it's cut early, the cure rate is incredibly high. It just needs a very simple surgery or a very simple procedure where we cut it out. Sometimes when they're cut so early, we can just burn it um, even and just, um, or freeze it with a cold spray or even use some chemotherapy creams alone. And you don't even need surgery yet, um, potentially as well. Um, other times when they become a little more invasive, a little bit larger, we have to add on radiation or just do radiation um, and potentially even chemotherapy um, or immunotherapy at this point too. But like I said, 97 to 99% of skin cancer when cut early can be treated with an in-office treatment without much else. Um, now, luckily, in the last five to seven years, especially, there have been such breakthroughs in modern medicine with what we call immunotherapy, where it can kind of target the exact mutation that that cancer has made and reverse that process really well. So before, you know, when I was even training 10 years ago, melanoma was thought to be, you know, invasive melanoma was thought to be a deadly diagnosis. Um, but really, there's such new and amazing improvements that have been made. Some clinical trials that are being done at Southwestern's, you know, um, cancer center itself, um, where these people who initially would have had a six-month prognosis are living years and years and years, if not decades, um, from these new drugs and medications. So it's always wonderful that we have this advanced science for these advanced cases, but our goal still is to catch things as early as possible so we can kind of treat it with the simplest possible treatment um, whenever possible as well. And so, you know, the question then becomes, you know, uh, skin cancer is, uh, or sun exposure definitely plays a role to a degree in terms of um, skin cancer development. So the question I'm often asked is how can I protect myself from the sun? And uh, especially in patients of color, I'll, I'll be asked the question, well, do I need to wear sunscreen? I have some degree of natural um, protection, which is true. But, you know, unfortunately, in this day, in this day and age, we really don't have great data on, um, on sunscreen use in patients of color. Um, it, it's unfortunate. Um, and I think there's been a bigger push, bigger drive to ensure patients of color are being in these studies and enrolled um, to a greater degree than they were, you know, even 10 years ago. Um, but um, we do know that ultraviolet light leads to DNA damage in the skin, which is probably one of the biggest known risk factors for skin cancer development. So the safest thing to do is still to protect oneself from the sun. Um, and, you know, it, whether it's sunscreen or not, um, just doing anything to protect yourself from the sun is important. So what does that mean? So seeking shade, um, wearing sun protective clothing. If you're going to go for a walk, go early in the morning or later in the afternoon when the sun's UV rays are not as strong. Usually, usually between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., the UV rays are the strongest. So avoiding outdoor time during that those hours um, is beneficial to you from a sun exposure perspective. Um, so going early in the morning or later in the afternoon or evening is definitely better. Um, and, and what else do we know about sun exposure? So sun exposure, regardless of DNA damage and everything else, it can result in pigmentary disorders. Um, it can change your pigment, um, what we call pigment alteration, and cre create a lot of photo aging. So, um, and, and I'm, I'm gonna show you some pictures. So long-term sun exposure, will result in wrinkles and leathery appearance of the skin, uneven pigment appearance, and even broken blood vessels. So this is somebody actually, um, this was a secretary who um, worked in an office building um, all her life, but the window was on the left side of her face. Um, and so her the left side of her face got all that sun exposure year after year, just through the window exposure. I'm not talking about tanning or anything else like that. So something we often forget is UV 
sprays, especially what we call UVA, penetrates windows. And um, you can just see the stark contrast between the side of her skin that had sun exposure or versus the side of her skin that did not. Um, and you can just see the texture change, the wrinkles that were formed, kind of the uneven coloration um, as well, where her right side of her face probably looks a good 10, 15 years younger. So patients, you know, now everyone wants to look, you know, you know 20 years younger at all times. And one thing that we say is prevention. Preventing sun exposure will make you look younger after, uh, you know, over years of time. This is a truck driver, similar concept. Um, um, was on the road, you know, most of his adult life. You can see the stark change in terms of the sun exposure that happened from the window um, of, of driving on the left side compared to the right side. So, you know, if, if you're on the road a lot and it sounds silly, but we'll say, hey, put sunscreen on, um, especially if you are more prone to skin cancers, more prone to kind of getting sunburns rather than kind of tanning easily. Um, and, and more than anything, um, you know, patients who are constantly asking us, hey, what's the what's what's the fountain of youth? What's going to make me look younger? Um, and it's really sun protection will kind of help prevent all that sun damage. So. Um, and, and younger people, um, you know, who may want to tan and everything like that will say, hey, um, this is one way we can kind of limit their sun exposure, um, showing that long term, it, it's not just a sun or skin cancer risk that they're putting themselves to, but also um, they're making themselves look older than they need to be. Now, um, you know, there's, we're often asked this question too, does you, ultraviolet light do anything good? Um, and it does, we can get kind of our vitamin D um, from ultraviolet light, and that is important. Um, especially, you know, if, if, if you're indoors often, you, you may be low um, in vitamin D. That being said, we always say to supplement it through your primary care doctors if you need pills or supplemental vitamins. Um, they can test your levels and supplement it that way. You don't want to just get sun exposure as your source of vitamin D. There are food sources that are um, higher in vitamin D, like milk and dairy products, um, if you can tolerate them. But really, you want to supplement them through your diet and, uh, and vitamins rather than just trying to get sun. So yes, sun is good. Um, it does kind of do some good things. But um, if you're low in vitamin D, you don't want to sit in the sun for five hours a day because it has more harm than benefit long term as well. Um, and just kind of kind of reiterating a lot of the points that I mentioned, um, really skin cancer, the goal is early detection. Um, and that means, you know, individual self-skin exam once a month, being aware of your own skin, seeing what's different or changing your new, what's bothersome or not, um, bringing those kind of concerning um, spots to the attention of your dermatologist or your primary care doctor. Um, and then, you know, it's very easy to biopsy something. Um, it's such a quick procedure. Um, and, um, you know, what we do is these two types of biopsies, if we're ever worried about something, um, we literally put literally a bleb of anesthesia in, that's all you really need. It's an in-office type of procedure where we can kind of use quick cutter-like tool to sample the skin or take a little blade and sample the surface. And this is, I'm talking about microscopics, you know, in terms of thickness, very, very small samples. Um, and that, that's really what we need to do in terms of diagnosing skin cancer to figure out what the next steps would be um, thereafter. And then in terms of, you know, skin cancer prevention, um, you know, sun avoidance is really the best, um, finding times that are better to be outdoors than, you know, when the UV rays are the brightest. Um, sunscreen really only slows UV exposure. We always recommend with sunscreens, wear something that's 30 or greater, I should say broad spectrum on the bottle, meaning it covers both UVA and UVB. Um, ideally water resistant. Um, and then the biggest thing is people forget to reapply it. So you're, you're outdoors, you're gonna sweat, especially in our Texas heat. Um, it's gonna wash off in two hours time really. So you have to really reapply it if you're outdoors all day. Uh, but really sun protective clothing um, and shade can be even more beneficial and, and more practical, let's say, than constant reapplication and avoiding the sun between 10 and some people will say 10 and 2 p.m. Um, others will, you know, other literature will say it's between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. But um, that's when the UV rays tend to be the greatest. Um, and just remember that windows and windshields are all sources of UV exposure. Um, people always ask, how much sunscreen should I be applying? For sun exposed skin, think about your face, your hands, potentially your legs. You need a shot glass full of sunscreen. 
Um, and most people are not putting that amount on whatsoever. They put, you know, a little drop, drop and they think that's enough, but um, it, it's really not. You need a shot glass amount for sun exposed skin um, and to reapply it. Now, historical sunscreens were very white. They look like, you know, you had zinc oxide on your face. Um, I think especially in the last two to three years, there have been a lot more kind of skin of color friendly sunscreens that are now on the market that blend better, that are micronized, that they can easily rub in. Um, um, some are even tinted uh, to a degree, so it, so, it's, um, so it doesn't have that kind of white complexion to it even when it hits the light. So there are definitely more um, options available, um, but still a lot of room to grow, um, especially in terms of making sunscreens kind of more, you know, skin of color friendly, let's say. Um, and then, you know, the question we're often asked is, what do I look for in a sunscreen? Um, there's different types of sunscreens that are out there. Um, we have our physical blockers. If you ever see a sunscreen that says baby on it, that's a physical blocker. That's usually our old school zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. It's really good stuff. Honestly, that's what I usually wear. Um, it, it tends to be a little thicker. Um, so a lot of people don't like it, um, especially I think females compared to males. Um, and definitely can look a little bit more like white cake found look. That being said, there are newer formulations that blend in a lot easier, but that's just considered the safest and, and that's what's used in, in, um, in infants. Um, and, and it works pretty much immediately because it's a physical blocker. The other type of sunscreen is a chemical sunscreen and that needs to take 15 minutes to actually activate in a way. And these are all different chemicals that are in them. Um, it's a little easier to apply. They tend to rub in a lot easier too, um, but um, but sometimes um, people can get irritated with the chemicals in this. So if you find that you're you know put sunscreen on and you get itchy and just uncomfortable, you could have an allergy to one of these ingredients, and that's where we'll tell you to switch to a physical blocker. You're much less likely to be allergic to a physical blocker um, ingredient compared to a chemical sunscreen. Um, and then there's so many different vehicles, meaning now they come in spray, gel, sticks, you know, creams, and patients are always like, what do you recommend? I say, you want to find something that you're going to actually use. It's like picking out a clone. What I may like, you may not like. Some may feel greasy, some may feel not greasy enough. So I would always say, you know, try something that you're comfortable with and that what you're actually going to use. Um, and a lot of people like the sprays because they're a lot easier to apply. It's a quicker kind of modality than you know, lathering up every time. Uh, but again, making sure that their water assistance is important. And then, you know, people always are questioned, what does SPF even mean? So SPF means sun protection factor, and it's only related to UVB protection. So there's two types of ultraviolet rays. There's A, UVA, that comes through windshields and that can kind of penetrate through everything. And then there's UVB. Um, UVB, um, essentially it's a testing that they do to see if you apply an SPF 15 sunscreen, it should allow 15 times longer exposure to get a faint burn more than anything else. But SPF does not address UVA protection. So there's no, in the US, um, there's no factor or, or scoring system for UVA protection. In Europe, there is. Um, there's push to kind of get a scoring system in the US as well for that. But again, what we tell our patients is get, use an SPF of 30 or greater and make sure it covers both UVA and UVB uh, because that's how you're getting the maximal protection in terms of picking out a sunscreen. Um, so people are like, well, should I just wear 100 every time? Not necessarily, honestly, because, um, you know, in, in reality, we sweat, especially in Texas heat, and it's all going to wash off. So no matter what you use, it's really kind of wiped off in two hours for the most part. So really, you want to reapply. Um, and and you're, you you kind of get diminished returns after SPF of 30. Yes, it's a little bit better, a little bit more protective, um, but, um, but usually 30 or greater is ample. Um, SPF 15 is not considered protective enough. And patients will also often say, oh, my makeup has sunscreen on. Remember, you're not putting a shot class of makeup on usually in order to get that SPF seven or eight that's listed on that makeup. And so we always say use sunscreen first and then add makeup over that to kind of layer it um, because the SPF in your makeup alone is really not gonna be enough. Um, and they don't add up. So if you have an SPF 15 of makeup and SPF moisturizer, you didn't get 30. Honestly, you're still at that 15 more than anything else. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I really like, you know, I think clothing is probably the most practical and easiest thing that you can always do. Wide brim hats, um, sun protective clothing now has something called UPF in it, um, ultraviolet protection factor that now is actually scoring clothing. Um, that I think is a lot easier. And you can even, um, there's this thing called sun guard that you can run your wash through that adds a little bit more protection in your clothing. Um, but again, um, it's an added step. And honestly, most things do have SPF within them, like jeans already have a high SPF in them alone. Um, great. Um, I think we have um, maybe 10 minutes or so for questions. So, you know, feel free to ask anything or anything related to skin or skin cancer or um, anything I can help ho hopefully answer.